During the COVID-19 crisis, some 90% of the world's school population, more than a billion learners worldwide, have had their educations rudely interrupted. In nearly 200 countries, millions of teachers have been forced to grapple with unfamiliar new technologies just to keep in touch with their students, let alone deliver to them the kind of knowledge and education they need for their futures. But once COVID-19 is defeated, if COVID-19 is defeated, Will we all simply go back to schooling as normal? Or will there be a change? Will there be new methods and new doors opened in the world of education? My guest today is Chris Jansen. He spent 30 years as an educator, as a mentor in lifelong learning, and is now the director of the Leadership Lab in New Zealand, which describes itself as a development collective that fosters collective responses to complex issues. He joins me for a chat about the impact of COVID on education now and in the future. Is COVID going to act as a propellant into a new educational future or are we going to just tread water until such time as the, the restraints come off and we go back to the old system? Oh, I think there's no guarantee which way that'll go. Um, but um, it's almost like we've seen into the future maybe a decade. And it's our choice now whether we take the learnings from that or not. And um, education is a huge institution. It's a big aircraft carrier, which has a lot of inertia. So um, if this won't change it, nothing will. But it still comes down to the decisions that schools and systems make in terms of uh, whether they rigorously look at the learning from this. You know, we had this whole online conversation even before COVID. I mean, the Khan Academy seems to have gained a degree of traction in the developing countries, uh, and we have a lot of tools and technologies that we can use to interact. But that whole MOOC conversation at higher education levels seems to have disappeared. I mean, it doesn't seem as if the higher education establishments really found it to be particularly effective. Uh, is, is that a, a correct assessment of where we are now, do you think? I mean, I think... Um massive online courses like you described haven't been very successful but that's not because of the technology that's the um, motivation uh, a lot of people have signed up and not a lot of people have turned up basically but um, I, th I think probably the mistake is to think you know let's compare face-to-face -face learning with online learning I think that that would be a um, mistake to sort of see that as an either or choice I think what we're really looking at is how to integrate face-to-face -face learning with technology um, because, face it, we're not going to run our schools online forever, are we? But we want to enhance what we do in the face-to-face -face environment using technology. There are two aspects to this, aren't there? I mean, one is uh, the actual practical realities. In some cases, face-to-face -face learning isn't possible. I mean, in many of the developing countries around Asia, for instance, getting to a school and in front of a teacher is itself a challenge. Um, but on the other hand, the, there's the, the motivational challenge that you mentioned earlier on. In, in Western societies, if you can bunk off, you're probably going to bunk off. Uh, but are those really the key issues driving or that should be driving our thinking as to the educational future? I mean, you're talking about developing countries. I think there's a massive opportunity here because we're basically we're talking about access to education. And that's where technology can open that up. You know, and whether it's physical distance because you can't actually get to a school or whether it's that you've got schools but you can't access the right kind of knowledge, I think that's probably the huge um, opportunity for the developing world. What about the, the kinds of knowledge that we're trying to impart? Do you think that uh, the examination and the modification of curriculums at school is going to change as a consequence of this? I mean, in the background, uh, of, at the end of last year, uh, the UN introduced a, a, a curriculum for sustainable development to be part of a, a learning environment. Um, I'm just wondering whether we are anyhow beginning to evolve towards a different methodology towards learning, which will incorporate more technology, irrespective of the COVID challenge. Yeah, yeah. so the, you're mentioning two different issues there. One's the um, curriculum, like the sustainable development goals. The other one's the methodology, which is the teaching process. And if we just take those apart for a moment, um, I think um, schools in general, like when you and I went to school, it was about knowledge acquisition and there was no other choice. That's where you got knowledge. You went to school to get the knowledge. But with the um, information age, now, as you know, technology has allowed us to access information without schools and we can retrofit our education if we wanted to. So that's created a bit of a identity crisis for schools because they're no longer their fountable knowledge. Um, I think... Um, 
because of that, there is a big opportunity for schools to be thinking maybe a role is not just passing on information and examinations of that, but to think about the methodology or the process of learning. And if we think down that track there, then we can actually see how technology not only gives us more information access, it allows us to probably personalise the learning to all the different learners we have in front of us. So that the face-to-face -face human interaction could be part of it, but the self-paced, self-directed learning with a online environment can be part of it as well. Let's talk about that self-direction a little bit for a moment, because one of the interesting parts of this whole COVID situation and, and putting kids in front of cameras rather than in front of teachers is in a way an empowerment of the children. They, they have a bit of agency uh, about their knowledge. Uh, and there are different models already. I mean, my niece's school here in Singapore, which is a, a normal sc uh, state school, they have basically translated the curriculum and the, uh, the schedule, the daily timetable online. They sit there in front of a camera doing the same lessons in the same order at the same times as they did before. Whereas my son, who's an international school, uh, they have a much more free-flowing, very diverse and uh, way of uh, adopting these things. And they have different modules at different times and they're really mixing it up. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a, a right way or a wrong way to do this? Well, it's dangerous to say right or wrong, but I, I would far prefer your sons than your daughters approach. Um, we have the whole range in New Zealand as well. Um, but the, the huge opportunity in this online lockdown we're in is to let students manage their own learning a bit more. Because traditionally we don't do that, where they come in and, and teachers lead the learning very strongly. And I mean, I have two daughters and they have both really, really enjoyed the agency or the self-management that's allowed them to decide what time of the day they do their learning, which order they do their learning. Um, fast learning, slow learning, loop it round again. And that's not normally their experience at school. It's, it's the timetable that you're talking about schedules the learning for them in batches of 25 students. And so um, I think the really big upside of what we've had for the last couple of months is students being given the opportunity to take more control. Is it ideal? I don't think so. I would not want to see my two daughters online schooling the whole time because what they're missing is the coaching and the human interface. But somewhere in between, there's a sweet spot where the humans, the teachers are there as coaches and mentors and um, probably bespoke um, specialists within sort of small conversations. But the um, curriculum itself can be um, loaded onto a technological platform and the students can work through that their own order. So we don't need, I don't think we need teachers to be standing up in front with PowerPoints as much as we're seeing. And I hope that's the big change that happens. Uh, you, you've, you've mentioned in passing very briefly that you, you, you don't think that technology is a, is a big part of what's going on here. Um, but I just want to press on that for a second. I mean, I'm sure that your daughters have taught you a great deal that you don't know about technology and about using online tools. Um, and certainly in, in the course of doing interviews like this, I've learned that a lot of the online tools that are available to me to do interviews like this are not up to the task. And I'm sure it's the same in education. I'm sure there is a, a, an enormous amount of technical advances that we can make to bridge the gap between online and face-to-face -face learning. Do you think that perhaps you and I are the wrong people to be talking about this? I mean, do you think when we talk about self-directed and, and agency for our children, we should be asking them what they want and how they should be configuring this process and what technologies that they feel comfortable with? Oh, well, there's no doubt that they have an advantage over us. And, and it's, it's ironic when you hear teachers saying things like, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't complicate it by using three platforms. And the student, if a student hears that comment, they look at you like, what planet are you from, mate? Because um, they handle multiple platforms all the time. Um, so that's an adult problem, not a student problem. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love to, I, in New Zealand here, I think our biggest opportunity here is to, when we get back face to face, is to sit down with our students and say, what was beneficial about that? And what was not beneficial about that? And, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna say the self-management aspect leading to motivation is the biggest thing I enjoyed, right? I didn't like to have to, I didn't like the, um, the lack of human contact, all right? So I want that back. And that's why I was saying before, the, the holy grail, if you like, is blended, blended face-to-face -face and online. It's no longer a question. It was never a question of online or face-to-face. -face. Blended is using both in real time. 
Uh, and I know that one of your interests now is, is talking about these things in a complexity frame where you're saying, actually, we need to stop looking at these things in a binary way, as in face-to-face -face or in-person, as in uh, siloed learning versus blended learning and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm just wondering to what extent is that message getting out there in the broader educational community and to a large extent in the broader government community? Because, you know, national, the, the national curriculum in government thinking is probably not welcoming complexity lenses at this point. Hmm. No, I, I think um, if you look at curriculum and what is taught, the content, I think governments have a strong interest in it because they dictate national curriculum. So I don't think we're going to see too much um, ambiguity in that space. But where the room for multiple perspectives is in the approach to learning, so the pedagogy, how we might learn. Because no, no government dictates that you have to teach your students in a certain way. And so there, there's the opportunity to really explore things. And I'm seeing kind of like you say, the binary, there's another binary going on for us right now because we, we may be back in, we'll probably be back in face-to-face -face mode in 10 days and incorporate that in your planning in the medium term. So, you know, July, August, September should be a deep dive into what have we learned from this so that we can implement that in six months' time. But let's not, let's not make the mistake of going back and saying, hey, we're different, let's change everything because that's going to cause a well-being issue and it's probably going to traumatise people. But who should, who should lead the analysis? Who should lead the reflection and uh, our next steps into the future? Should it be the educators, those people uh, of probably uh, older generations who really run the system? Should it be governments who have their own particular way of dealing with it? Or should we be thinking more in terms of uh, not that necessarily the tech companies, but certainly the private sector getting involved in providing some solutions that provide for distant learning? Mm. It probably depends on the country you live in in terms of the, the level of centralization or decentralization of decisions like that. Um, like in New Zealand, we're very decentralized. So the schools have a lot of autonomy to make those decisions. So um, the government will not mandate that every school has to review the learning and therefore implement something. Um, they will leave that up to the individual schools and their boards. Um, so probably in our country, the agency sits with the, the uh, leadership within the school. Um, not sure about tech companies. They, uh, it'd be fantastic to have them involved, um, but they certainly won't lead the charge on that. I, I have a feeling that particularly in, in the developing countries and, and the area in which I operate in Asia, the possibility of providing better education through better technology, uh, because as we talked of earlier, of the, of the difficulty of getting resources and getting to places, may be a much more attractive option. Uh, I mean, I'm just wondering that from, a, from your perspective, though, in, in the situation in which you find yourself, would you welcome the greater involvement of technology uh, and um, private sector corporations doing that? Do you think that that might pose a danger to the, the whole idea of pedagogy? Oh, no, I have no misgivings about that. I, I would love to see them as partners in this because what you're kind of describing is a step change in the way learning's delivered. At the moment, like in our country, we have compulsory education. So students have to be in class a certain amount of the time per week. Now, if you change the rules on that, like at the moment, they're not there at all because we can't because of COVID. But if you change the rules on that and said learning has to happen, but it doesn't have to happen on site, then you can hack education completely and you can think, OK, why can't we have centres of excellence for face to face? And why can't we have community partnerships for learning as well? And why can't we learn across countries? All right, we could hack it in all sorts of different ways. But to do that, what we'd have to do is let go of the fact of attendance. You know, does one student have to attend one school? Because at the moment, we most governments uh, have rules around that. And there'll be disciplinary procedures that ensue if you don't attend. Right. So what does attendance mean? Is attendance the same as engagement? I don't think so. Of course, we want engagement. But what if we could uh, change the requirements around attendance? Then you could have students from one country working with students from another country. You know, you could have um, students based in business, you know, learning there. They wouldn't have to be at school. Now, that, a little bit of that happens at the moment. But generally, that's the exception. Mainly what we do is we require students to go to school for 20 hours a week or 25 hours a week. Let me, let me finish with a, a quick final question about age. Now, we've talked about uh, the difference between developing countries and um, 
and developed countries. But let's talk about the difference between older learners and younger learners, because one of the trends in education, as you know, and one of the trends in, in societal thinking right now is that we all, as we grow up, have to be lifelong learners. We have to continue to educate ourselves and improve our skill sets. So when we get beyond the school age, when we get beyond university age, and we're in our middle age looking to improve our skill set, that's a situation where technology is going to be much more important, isn't it? And that's a situation, particularly in developing countries, uh, where the private sector engagement and the coordination and leadership of government is mm -hmm. going to become mm -hmm. much more important. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, absolutely agree. And uh, I'm pretty sure um, your friends will be like my friends. We're all learning a lot. We're taking the advantage at the moment of getting all these free opportunities to learn. And we're enrolling in all sorts of courses around the world to actually upskill ourselves. And thank Thankfully, people are mainly giving them for free at the moment. So it's going to be a question of access there. But um, what a great, great uh, thing it would be if people of all ages could become lifelong learners. Awesome. Chris, it's been great talking to you. Thanks very much indeed. And good luck with the return to normal schooling in New Zealand. Thank you very much.